Hello, everyone. My name is Kevin Burgess. I'm an educator, professor at the university, and I have a research group in biomedicinal chemistry. I read Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, hoping to get something out of it for education. I did. It was a bit of a squeeze, but I did. And let me tell you what I found. Kahneman proposes that when a person answers a problem, especially for behavioral economics, that person will answer using either system one or system two. He defines system one or system two. What is system one? System one is almost reflexive thinking. It's fast, automatic, non-deliberate. It comes to a speedy answer that may not always be right. System two is more logical. It's more deliberate. It takes more time. It takes more effort. But it should come to a better answer than System 1. Kalman's book really argues that System 1 and System 2 work together in harmony most of the time. But sometimes there's a tension between them, and they lead us astray. To explain this, he uses a lot of terms. And I'd like to go through the jargon. Kalman's key concepts are as follows. Framing, loss aversion, sunk cost fallacy, prospect theory, representativeness heuristic, availability heuristic, anchoring. Seven concepts that he ties together. Framing was explored first in a wonderful book called Nudge. I think I might do a video on that sometime. I really enjoyed this one. And it's all about how you frame a question to lead the answerer towards a certain answer. This has a big effect in society, it has a huge effect when you look at a big number of people, like in an election. Let's suppose a situation. We take a sample of people and we offer them, lucky day, $100. Game, guaranteed, no strings attached. Or you can choose a 50% chance at gaining $200. And then we take another cohort of people. Not so lucky day. Sorry, you're going to lose $100 for sure, unless you take the option to risk $200 at a 50% chance. Both bets are symmetric. Either $100 gain, possible $200 gain, or $100 loss, possible $200 loss. But the outcome for the two groups is different. In the first group, where we compare the gain versus a 50% chance, most people take the $100 gain. But in the second group, where there's a 50% chance to lose to $100, the majority took that chance. Why? Well, they like the idea of a certain gain, but they hate the idea of losing anything themselves. And so to avoid that risk aversion, they choose the 50% chance, risking a loss of $200. The outcome is different. Sunk costs fallacy, common sense, really. Let's say we invest a lot of time or effort or money into something. It's not going well, but we feel like sooner or later, it, it must get better. So we invest more, pouring money good money after bad. Prospect theory. That's the type of situation where we really don't have any good basis for judgment, or perhaps we do and we ignore it. And we look towards the possible outcomes and make our decision almost solely upon that. What are heuristics? Heuristics are an expression of system one. They're problem-solving methods that are non-optimal, and do not always give the right answer, but take you to an answer quickly, and often that is very helpful. So a representative heuristic is where we draw on something that we've done before, it looks similar, and we choose to solve a problem, answer a question in a similar way. That can be very helpful. It can be misleading sometimes. An availability heuristic is a judgment based on examples. For instance, if you're asked to guess the frequency of shark attacks, 
And there's been two or three psychic attacks recently in the news, have been all over it, highly publicized. You think they're really frequent and you tend to guess high because the availability of examples to you is high. That's an availability heuristic. Anchoring. Let's say we're buying a house. We might not know what the house is worth. If the seller price is half a million dollars, that anchors the negotiations there if you choose to go along with it. Anchoring can bias the answer people give to questions. Anchoring can be implicit in the question. What do I think about these seven key concepts? All of them exist. They're real, but they're not distinct, and some of them overlap, and some are more important than others. For instance, framing has subsections, I think, to be anchoring, representativeness heuristics, and availability heuristics. Whereas loss aversion is related to prospect theory some of the time, and certainly to sunk cost fallacy. And there are some situations in which framing and loss aversion work together. So what can students get out of this book? Those are all characteristics of system one. Students, when they're answering problems, should remember, oh, duh, don't jump to conclusions. That's overuse of system one. Beware of how the problems are framed. I know as an organic chemist, if I ask students, please tell me the products of A coupling with B. If A and B couple on this side to form C, more students will get it right than if I ask the question, please tell me what happens when A couples with B. And even less students will get it right if I ask, well, what happens if A couples with B? That doesn't lead them to the right answer. This one does. A clever student will redraw the starting materials like this and deduce the product. Framing. Don't be too cautious. Explore. Your time isn't wasted if you don't come to the immediate answer. It's good to be imaginative. And obviously, better decisions come from considering more data. The more representative and example heuristics input into a system, the better the likely a system one conclusion is. What about educators? What about professors? People trying to teach as well as they possibly could. What can they gain from this book? Consider a mathematician, a man, for instance. How does he approach a problem? The first consideration is the mathematician will look at how the problem is presented. That's framing. And then he will choose a strategy to solve it. And that strategy may be based on representative or availability heuristics, methods he's used in the past to solve that type of problem. And often, someone's an experienced mathematician knows exactly what strategies to draw on. System one is helping him. If things go wrong and the mathematician starts along the wrong path or the suboptimal path, then he may be dissuaded from changing course by loss aversion or sunk cost fallacy. He's invested so much thought into it so far, he's gonna keep going in that direction. That may be good, that may be bad. So in something as logical as a math problem, where there's only one answer, for instance, you might think it's all system two. But actually, the math problem might be solved by a series of steps. And how did the mathematician learn those steps? By using system one, trial and error, seeing what felt good, seeing what really worked, and then ingraining them over so many years of practice. He knows exactly what situations to apply them in. System one provided the knowledge to learn the steps to get to a logical answer. So what do I think? The steps in logic and deduction are learned through system one. I'm sorry to my advanced organic chemistry class, but I have to say, the best students I've ever taught are babies. Babies have a completely open mind. They're very attentive. They want to go along with you. They want to learn. They use system one all the time. They pick things up, they put them in the mouth, they shake them, they feel them. They're, they're building their emotional connectivity to the problem. And that takes me full circle, actually. I really feel like system one 
is nearly always a precursor to system two. There really isn't a system one and a system two. It's a coherent transition. Even Carmen, at the end of his book, after writing the whole book, telling everybody that there's a system one and a system two, at the end he says, well, actually, there's not system one, system two. I think learning takes place by our emotions, by our system one first, and then we learn how reliable it is and how many situations we can use it in justifiably. Then it seems as if when we use lots of transitions learned by system one in a piece of logic, it appears to be system two, but actually we got there using system one. I've said before that I think all learning is due to emotion. I've published this video. Please check it out. The link's below. The link to Nudge is below and the link to Daniel Kahneman's book. Thank you again for listening. Bye-bye www.byinquisition.org is where you can find my workbooks for sophomore organic chemistry one and two and for advanced undergraduates and PhD students. I have an electronic book on Apple Books. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.